Greetings, test takers. This is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. I want to give out a shout out to Kaplan. Uh, Kaplan has given me permission to explicate uh, their content, their questions. That gives my viewers a free look at Kaplan questions. Uh, Kaplan also gives a 10% discount to my viewers, and that discount code is Guru10 at checkout. So if you're already a Kaplan uh, student, you've made a fine choice, but if you're uh, using some other vendor and you'd like a supplement, the Kaplan Q Bank is a great supplement for about 60 bucks with the 10% discount code. Okay, now the commercial is over. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. Um, when I'm teaching classes, sometimes we have time to do practice questions. Sometimes we do not. And I know how many people who are viewers of the channel love practice questions. And so what we're going to do is go over 85 questions that I sometimes use as practice performance opportunities in the conduct of the class. So that's the game plan for today. And uh, like I say, kudos to Kaplan for allowing us to uh, have access to this content. All right, let's get started on these uh, journey of 85 questions. Which of the following individuals may not open a joint account? A parent and a minor, two spouses, three sisters, two business partners. But we don't open accounts for minors directly. The only account we would have with a minor would be a custodial account, Uniform Gift to Minors Act, Uniform Transfer to Minors Act, with the uh, parent as the uh, custodian. Oop. So the answer whoop, is A, A. Obtaining all the following information would obtain all the following complies with the regulations regarding customer identification programs, except, you know, uh, we have to have in our written supervisory procedures, uh, what we're gonna do if we're unable to identify uh, somebody. This is the Patriot Act, it requires that we have a picture ID and we don't uh, send things to PO box as well. I take that back. On the original documentation on the account, we need a physical address. Once we have that physical address, then we were more than happy to send things to a PO box, but initially we're gonna need the uh, physical address. And so the answer to this one is C. Whoop, I gotta get my mouse going the right direction here. So we need physical addresses to open accounts. Buying municipal bonds, but normally be consutable, uh, suitable for, an individual investor, certainly an individual investor in a high tax bracket would certainly consider buying municipal bonds that pay interest federally tax exempt and perhaps state and local, depending on where they live and what kind of bond they buy. Yeah, we have mutual fund portfolios that buy uh, municipal bonds. We have tax-free municipal bond funds, indeed, so B. Uh, corporations buy municipal bonds. D, a defined benefit plan. No, in a retirement plan, you wouldn't be putting a mini bond in there because you don't need tend to worry about the tax consequences of the investment while it's in the retirement account. And so, yeah, it would be unsuitable for any kind of a retirement account, including a defined benefit plan. Four, if a new joint tenant with rights or survivorship account is opened, all the following statements are true, except you definitely need to be able to contrast on your exam, joint tenants in common or tenants in common with joint tenants with rights or survivorship. So we're looking for something that's false here. So be careful on these true accepts. Orders may be given by either party. That is true. Uh, checks may be drawn in the name of either party. No, 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 no. We only cut checks to the title of the account. Whatever the title of the account is, that's how we cut the checks. That is false. Mail may be sent to either party with the permission of each party in the event of death. Very testable. The decedent's interest goes to the other party. That's very, very testable D to know that. And so the answer there is B. We only cut checks to the title of the account. A power of attorney is not required for a registered rep to choose which of the following. Time and price is getting good execution. I think a good way to remember this is action asset amount. If I as a broker don't have trading authorization, I'm not gonna be able to make a decision about action, whether to buy or sell, asset, which security to buy or sell in the amount, quantity. I can, as a broker without trading authorization, make a decision about time and price. That's called execution, getting good execution. That happens all day long. An example of that uh, would be a market not held account where I tell my floor broker, 
The floor broker is the one who executes orders for clients of uh, New York Stock Exchange member firms. Buy me 10,000 shares GE today at whatever time and price you think looks good. That does not require trading authorization. So remember, we got to be careful here. It says not required. So security would, number would, time and price would not. Time and price would not. All right, let's look at our uh, next set of practice questions. Usually when I have time in class, after each you know lecture discussion, we'd be doing some of these questions. So uh, that's why it starts back at one because you know we take a break, do some performance opportunities, come back. So anyways, holders of common stock would generally vote on. So remember there's two styles of voting found on the corporate charter. Those are statutory and cumulative. You definitely should be able to distinguish between the two. You should definitely know cumulative protects minority shareholders. And you can get this kind of a question right with what I call the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not like the other. The issuance of convertible preferred stock. Yeah, the issuance of convertible debt requires shareholder approval because it represents potential dilution. And so A is a significant thing that we should vote on. Uh, no, the board decides whether a cash dividend is to be declared, right? The board does that. That doesn't require shareholder approval. The board gets together, decides what resources they need to keep as retained earnings based on the net income and how much they're going to pay out as a dividend. Remember, very testable, you don't have a right to a dividend. You only have a right to a dividend if declared. That's a big if. So it's very possible the board may decide, hey, we need to keep some of those resources here. We're going to cut the dividend or omit the dividend, whatever the case may be. Uh, by the way, explication means not only just doing the questions, it means talking about them too. So that's why I'm going to ranting off, riffing off the, the uh, answers. Uh, whether and how much of the corporation stock will be purchased by the corporation, that's called treasury stock. And again, that's associated with corporations that have uh, more, are generating more uh, net income or earnings than they need to deploy back into the business. So there's a couple of ways we can return excess capital to shareholders. One is through the declared, uh, declaring a dividend, uh, distribution of a dividend. Another is by buying stock into the treasury. I would definitely know that treasury stock has no voting rights and pays no dividends. And again, that's a decision that the board makes. Whether an administrative assistant should be promoted management. No, that has nothing to do with the shareholders. So the answer to that question is A. Two, which of the following security typically carries the highest dividend rate? I kind of like this question. So what we have to do here is think, okay, well, which one of these is going to be least attractive to a preferred stockholder and therefore we're gonna to have to compensate them. That's the way I would go about it. There's a lot of ways, as long as you get the right answer, who cares? Uh, straight preferred, uh, convertible preferred. Well, no, you should definitely know the convertible would be uh, less interest rate, right? Because you have the opportunity to switch your status from being a preferred stockholder to becoming a common stockholder. So you should definitely know that that's uh, not case. Participating preferred, pays you earnings uh, beyond some stipulated amount. Again, that's a good thing. The bad thing here is that the issuer calls it away from you. And so the issuer reserves the right to place high, replace high cost preferred stock with lower cost preferred stock. And so the answer there is D, that's called call risk, very testable associated with declining interest rate environment. You say, Dean, that pays more than other, it has a higher dividend than other preferreds I've been looking at. I say, I agree, it does, but that's because it's callable. Now, maybe it does get called, maybe it doesn't. Call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. And then you know what we should know what prevents the issuer from calling the bonds or the preferred stock. The call protection period and the price. So those are the two components of what we call call protection. A uh, bond you are recommending to a customer has call protection. What does that mean? Well, we just recently briefed, just talked about that, right? It is the number of years into the issue, issue before the issuer, if investor, may exercise the call. No, 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 no. You, the investor, a bondholder, you're not the one who calls the bond. The bond is called away from the bondholders by the issuer. B, it's a number of years into the issue before the issuer may exercise the call for privilege. There we go. A test-taking trick is called the principle of mutual exclusion. We know that the answer here is either A or B because they say opposite things. They say opposite things. The issuer may set up a sinking fund. Yeah, sinking fund is called funded debt. Some debt has a sinking fund. Some uh, bonds do not. If it's just trust me, I'll, when I get there, I'll have the money for you. That's called unfunded debt. So uh, that's not what a call is about. The issuer records the phone number of investors. <laughs> no, the answer is 
uh, be. The coupon on a bond can best be described as the nominal yield, also known as the fixed or stated rate of return. Of all the yields you're held accountable for in the exam, that is the one that does not change. Does not change. Which of the following bonds only pay interest when and if earned? You should definitely know that income or adjustment bonds only pay interest when and if earned. You should further know that they all, so the way we say that, by the way, is they trade flat. That means no calculation of accrued interest. You know, the buyer is not paying the uh, issuer that no accrued interest. And uh, these are used in bankruptcies and restructurings. These aren't a retail product. Again, in, in explications like this, we're not doing lecture. We're just, you know, going over test questions. So that is definitely B is in boy, B is in boy. Very testable, very testable, no order priority or priority in liquidation. Six, upon a corporate liquidation, which of the following debt securities is paid last? Now, again, you know, your series seven is a giant reading test. And you got to read carefully. It says debt securities. So, you know, this goes out of the door because it didn't ask us about equity securities. And so subordinated ventures get paid after the mortgage bonds. Now, uh, you should be able to do all of the securities from junior to senior or senior to junior. So it's secured debt, unsecured debt, preferred common, or from junior to senior in liquidation, common, preferred, unsecured debt, secured debt. Uh, which of the following callable municipal bonds must the yield to call be recorded on the confirmation? So. MSRB says we need to quote yield to call when a bond's trading at a premium. So basically what we got to do here is find out which of these bonds is trading at a premium. Now in bond speak sevens, when it's, I say the sevens, that means the coupon is seven. And basis is the fancy word for yield to maturity. So uh, one thing I recommend is using the teeter-totter. And the reason I love the teeter-totter is the teeter-totter turns judgment questions like this and do aim and shoot questions. So a flat line represents a bond at par. And so we have a 7% bond, and that's what makes the, that's the middle of the, the teeter-totter. A 7% bond, the yield of maturity is nine and a half. That is a bond at a discount. Again, I'm not lecturing. I have a whole lecture called Bond Teeter-Totter. I have a whole nother lecture called Four Bonds, Not James Bond. So that's not the point of the explication. So if this looks uh, foreign to you, I highly recommend you go back and re, re, uh, review that. Uh, here we have a bond with an 8% coupon and 8% yield to maturity. So that's a bond at par. And there we go. A bond that I have is 9% coupon, but only yields to me uh, 7% is a bond trading at a premium. And so the answer to that is bond C, as in Charlie, that's the bond that's at a premium. Bond B is a bond at a discount. So the answer to that question is C as in Charlie. C as in Charlie. So there we go. There's our answer for that one. Uh, which of the following securities is always originally issued at a discount? You just definitely know securities are issued at a discount and uh, that would certainly include T-bills, right? All money market securities, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, T-bills are issued at a discount except, except a negotiable jumbo CD. So the answer there is C. Uh, a treasury bond is quoted in the Wall Street Journal as follows. The bid, so I'm willing to buy this into my inventory at 115.30 seconds, and I'm willing to sell it out of my inventory if I work the treasury desk at 117.30 seconds. And so the first thing we gotta know is that this is trading at a premium. You know, a premium is more than par. Par is 100 and this is trading at a premium. It says the yield of mature or yield is 3.9. Uh, 
And so they're asking us, what uh, is the nominal yield? So remember when you have a bond at a premium, the highest yield, it says the nominal yield, is gonna be the highest yield, which is greater than 3.9. Let me just clean this up. So there is our bonds, our teeter-totter again. There's our bid and our ask. There is the 3.9. The people buy bonds based on the yield to maturity. And this would be a bond at uh, greater than. Uh, P.S. I don't like that it has yield to call because you should know that treasury notes and treasury bonds are not callable. Again, I'm explicating or sharing with you Kaplan questions. This isn't a Dean question, but you should definitely know that treasury bonds, treasury notes are not callable. We're just trying to show you how the teeter daughter is helpful. Uh, which of the following projects is most likely financed by general obligation uh, rather than a revenue bond? Uh, I highly recommend that you take a sheet of paper, you fold it in half, and on one side, write all the terms associated with GO bonds, and on the other side, all the terms associated revenue bonds, because a big part of the exam is distinguishing between GOs and revenues. So uh, rather than a revenue bond. So we're looking for something that isn't financed with a user fee. So we can finance a public golf course with a user fee. We can finance a municipal hospital with a user fee. We can uh, finance an airport to a user fee. A new high school, no, new high school would be, excuse me, new high school would be financed through the issuance of GO bond property taxes, ad valerum taxes, ad valerum taxes. A calamity or catastrophe, if you call, very testable. So the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board says that as a um, person getting people involved in municipals, I should disclose everything, but there's one thing that need not be disclosed to investors according to MSRB rules, which is a catastrophe call. The catastrophe call, calamity call, would be found in the trust indenture, but it need not be disclosed to investors. So what is this calamity or catastrophe call about? It's about interest rates have fallen and a building constructed with a revenue bond financing has been condemned. There we go, ding, 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 ding. See, the issuer has accumulated excess money. No, nope. the issuer must call. No, nope. the answer there is B, B. Uh, 10 municipal bonds were purchased with a 4% nominal yield for settlement on February 1st, 2021. The maturity date is July 1st. Now that's helpful because if we know the maturity date is July 1st, and that's when I'm getting my principal on my last interest check, I now know that this is a J and J bond. This is a J and J bond, January and July. That's helpful because I need to know from January to February, right? Now, when we came up with the Uniform Practice Code, we didn't want high talent men and women to have to remember nursery, not, uh, nursery rhymes and nothing humps about how many days have September. And so in the Uniform Practice Code, we arbitrarily say that every month, has 30 days. Now, the other trick in this one is to pay attention because it says we bought it for settlement on February 1st. So we don't need a new deal with T plus two. Corporate's immunity settled T plus two, but they already told us that settlement is February 1st. So we calculate the accrued interest from the last interest payment date, which we have determined is January 1st, up to, but not including settlement, which was February 1st, and then every month in corporate communities has 30 days. And so the answer here is going to be 30 days. So there's our last interest payment date. We go up to, but not including February 1st. That means the buyer owes the seller for all of the days in January, because I, the seller, held the bond for January. And you're going to get a check on July 1st that represents the entire time frame. And I said, whoa, 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 some of that's mine. By the way, it has nothing to do with there's 10 bonds. So up to, but not including. We said corporates and municipal bonds have 30 day months. That's very testable. That means there's 360 days in the year. And so the answer is 30 days. Now, this is just a trick uh, that I sometimes show people in class about how to do this. So if you want to use my trick, let me get a thing here. Just a trick. If you want to use a shortcut, you can just simply take settlement, which is February 1st, subtract the last time the bonds paid interest. This is just a shortcut. And one from one is zero, one from two is one. And then you just got to remember that every month has 30 days. So that's just a shortcut. And if we want to use the shortcut, you just take 
the settlement date, February 1st, in this case, 2-1, subtract the last interest payment date, in this case, January 1st, 1-1, and that's just another way to go about that. A municipal bond rating service would consider all the following when evaluating a revenue bond except, so one of these things does not go to a revenue bond. As we said, a big part of your exam is distinguishing between GOs and revenues. As I said, I take a sheet of paper, fold it in half. On one side, I'll write all the terms associated with revenue bonds, and on the other, all the terms associated with GO. So debt service certainly goes to a revenue bond. Feasibility studies certainly go with a revenue bond. Operating revenues certainly go to a revenue bond. The public's attitude towards debt is associated with a GO bond, right? Like the collection ratio, you know, whatever that case may be. When a municipality is allocating funds from a revenue producing facility under a net revenue pledge, this is very testable. Again, this is found in the trust indenture. It's called the flow of funds. And the flow of funds under net revenue pledge is going to be the operations and maintenance fund. That is the one that has priority, very testable. I hope when you're doing these explications that you have a notepad or five, four by six or three by five cards so that you can take notes and you know maybe make a flashcard or have your notes, your study notes uh, next to you as you go through these uh, explications. This will be, uh, let's see, this will put us over the top of 600 practice questions in total in the practice question final exam playlist on series seven. And uh, we're gonna have a practice test five and a practice test six very soon, a practice test five that I've written and a practice uh, test six from uh, Kaplan I'm gonna explicate. So that'll put us up close to a thousand practice questions. So. ACBC bond was issued at par, is now trading at 89 and a half. If the nominal yield is six and the bond is callable at 102, what is the yield to call? Now, I kind of like this because what we're, what you're the thinking, you're going to say, well, didn't you tell me I don't have to crunch yield to call? And here's a question asked me yield to call. No, you don't have to crunch yield to call because as you look at this, you say, okay, you're using your teeter totter. And we say, okay, well, let's just look at this relationship. This is a bond at a discount. And so we know that the yield to call is gonna be higher than six. So it's gotta be C or D. So that alone gives us a 50-50. Now, the next thing I could do is say, okay, well, I may not have to do yield to call, but I certainly gotta be able to do uh, current yield. So I'm gonna take the annual interest that's what 6% is, 6% is based on par. I'm gonna divide that by 895. That's the current market price of the bond. And current yield certainly is testable. Current yield is certainly testable. So when I do that, let me get my calculator. 60 divided by 895. I get 6.7 is current yield. So if current yield is 6.7, that's what you got to be able to do, by the way. You do have to be able to current current yield. That means that the yield to call has got to be 7.7 .7 based on that answer set. So Again, it's not, can you do the math on yield of maturity yield to call? It's, do you know the relationship? So again, here's the teeter-totter. This is an ABC. There's our 895, 89 and a half. That's a half a point, eight, 89 and a half percent of par, par being 1,000, so 895. It's a bond at a discount. So we know the yield of maturity is higher than the current yield. We determined the current yield was 6.7. And so that means yield of maturity has to be something uh, greater than that. All right, so uh, which of the following characteristics is not shared by both a mutual fund and a variable annuity separate account? You know, I think of a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. Because the separate account or sub account is a mutual fund. So the separate account and the mutual fund are both professionally managed, both. The payout plans provide the client with income for life. And only the variable annuity can you annuitize and turn it into an income stream that you can outlive. That's not true of a mutual fund. They're asking what's true of both, and B is not true of both. 
The client may vote for the board of directors or board of managers. Yep. And the client assumes investment risk. Absolutely. So the answer there is B. B. A retired person is seeking to maximize income with reasonable safety and liquidity. Most likely consider, so reasonable safety and liquidity. So uh, let's see, I don't think I'm gonna get the intermediate, let's see, large cap growth funds out. So I'll do process of elimination here. Uh, that's out. Uh, maximize reasonable safety. I think I'm gonna say, well, reasonable safety uh, means I'm gonna toss out the government bonds and I'm gonna go for the high grade corporate bond fund given that answer set. Because they, again, reasonable safety, it said absolute safety, credit risk. You know, I'm still have credit risk in A, but you know, a little less than uh, no credit risk in governments, but I get a little extra income for that. A mutual fund that charges 12B1 fees. 12B1 fees are promotional costs. So sales fees are promotional costs, promotion costs are promotional costs, printing costs. So the management fee is not part of the promotional expense. I would know that uh, I can only charge up to one quarter of 1% 0.25 and refer to myself as a no load fund. If I go past that, I'm not gonna be as a 12B1 fee. I'm not gonna be able to refer to myself as a no load fund. To implement, we're gonna to have to have a majority vote of the outside board of the uh, mutual fund. A uh, person new in investing wants to invest $25,000. $25, and the money will not be needed for some time. So that means we can be long terms, dash away and forget about it. A uh, balanced fund with both equities and debt has been recommended by the registered rep. Which share class would be most suitable for aligning with this investor's profile? Well, it looks like to me that we can go for the class B share that has the contingent deferred sales charge because of the long-term horizon. Class C would be, you know, have a 12B1 fee more for short term. And so A would be the front loads. Class B would be the appropriate response there. All right, let's get into uh, some uh, option questions. So most protection on a long stock. So protection means you're going to buy an option. So you should have been able to get this to A or C. So protection, we're going to buy the option. And for income, we're going to sell the option. So most protection, I'm going to have a choice to sell. So the answer there is a long put, a long put, a protective put. To generate income on in a long stock position. So for income, I'm going to sell the option. And so I'm going to sell a call, do a covered call, or what's called a buy right. And so the answer here is B, short the call, short the call. A customer buys 10 July 25 calls at four and a half. Now, again, if you've been with me for a while, you know what Dean likes to do. What Dean likes to do, just as tart in terms of my process, is I always like to write underneath what am I looking at. I'm looking at a choice to buy the stock at the strike price. That's what that is. At uh, 25 and I paid four and a half, my break even is 29 and a half, not the question. I'm bullish, not the question. My max gain is unlimited, not the question. Uh, max loss is the total premium I paid. That is the test question. And so the total premium I paid, let me get a bigger font here. I'm buying a, uh, 10 contracts, so 10 contracts times uh, one, because one contract times 100 equals $4,500. So that's what I'm paying for this position. And whenever I buy an option, that is my maximum risk. So if uh, the stock is 25 or lower, the contracts are going to expire and I'm gonna lose that money. That's called an opening purchase. That was an opening purchase. So there's our premium, there's our number of contracts, there's our multiplier, boom, there's $4,500. An investor buys an ABC 45 uh, put. So again, what I like to do, what Dean likes to do is intestable, but I always want to, as part of my process, like to put underneath the contract, what am I looking at? And when I buy a put, what I'm looking at is a choice to sell. So I'm looking at a choice to sell the stock at the strike price.
425 when the stock's trading at 43. The put has intrinsic value. So call up, put down, call up, put down. So we're looking at a 45 put. So put down, you know, you can do that or is it likely to be exercised? So there's my strike price of 45. And it says that the stock price is 43. Uh, I get in terms of my process, like to put the market price either above or below my strike price to make it tra transparent to me. Oh, now I got to be careful. They didn't ask me, what is the intrinsic value of the put, which is two. They asked me below which would it have intrinsic value. Below 45, it has intrinsic value. So yeah, I gotta be careful, RTFQ, be careful what you're being asked, right? I almost went into a discussion of what this is. Uh, by the way, over here, you see, I have the two of a time value and the 225, which is uh, the uh, time value and two is the intrinsic value. So we look over here, where, you know, the premium is four and a quarter. So that's intrinsic value. And that is the time value. Okay, and then it says for fun, why don't we just go ahead and uh, demonstrate our prowess or lack thereof. The break even is gonna be 45 minus four and a quarter, which I think is uh, 4075. The uh, max gain is when it goes all the way to zero. There's one contract here. So that would be uh, 40 and three quarters all the way to zero. So $4,075 max loss is the premium, smart bear. Uh, $425 and you are bearish, you are bearish. So those were our bonus questions. There's our strike price, boom, boom, boom. If your customer owns 100 shares and wants to participate in a big price increase, so that's important. So that means you're not gonna sell the call because if you sell the call, you won't participate in a big price increase. There will be a ceiling there. There will be a ceiling there. But not participate in big price decline. There we go. Looks like we're looking for a floor. We're looking for some protection. So what we're going to do here is buy a put. Now, buying the put gives us the ability to participate in a big price increase suitability, but not participate in a big price decline. So the answer, whoop, the answer there is D. D. An investor with no other position buys one CDE, May 65, put it three and a half. If the investor buys the stock at 63 and a half and exercises the put, what is the investor's profit or loss? So whenever we got a lot of things going on, I highly recommend to use a T. Uh, that people just only have been at it about 30 minutes. And so I would just like to tell you when we've been at it about 30 minutes. So if you choose to, you can uh, take a break and uh, come back to it. And when you're you know, uh, refreshed. Anyways, uh, what I like to do is I like to get a T fired up and I like to track money in and out. Lots of ways to do options. I would tell you that, you know, uh, I'd be like, oh, I got some other method I, you know, found somewhere. And, you know, it's fine as long as you're gonna write answers. But, you know, I would tell you that most of us have been doing this for a while and know that this is the thing that works for all option strategies. Not some option strategies, all option strategies. I know that people have other methods. Sometimes they'll say, well, that won't be on your test, so it doesn't matter that it doesn't work for that. I am not so sure I would uh, buy into that. All right, so there's my T to track money in and out. Now, again, I suggest you do things on a per share basis. So uh, let's see. So we're going to go track this money. We uh, bought a May 65 put at three. So maybe before we get started, maybe we just want to uh, follow our thing. What we're going to do here is say, okay, this is a choice. Which is cost money. This is a choice to sell CDE at the strike price. And so we're going to have a choice to sell the stock at the strike price, and that's going to cost us three and a half points. So I'm going to put that in here. Again, I'm not going to put 350 because I believe in doing things on a per share basis. Uh, if the investor buys the stock at 63 and a half, is that dollars out or dollars in? That is going to be dollars out as well. And it says exercises, exercises the put. So what does it mean when I exercise the put? That means 
that I have, I'm going to exercise my choice to sell. I'm going to exercise my choice to sell. And I have a choice to sell it at 65. And then what I'm going to do is just net that out and say, okay, well, uh, I'm out of pocket. Let me get another. I'm out of pocket. 67. You know, three and a half for my option contract, 63 and a half for the stock. And I brought in 65, so I think I'm a loser. I lost a two points or $200. The answer is C. Now, the other way you could do is just memorize break evens. If you memorize the break even, that would be 65 minus three and a half, 61 and a half, and 63 and a half is two points in the wrong direction. And there's a pretty version of that. A customer owns 100 shares of stock in which to generate additional income. That is very much a test question. I can't imagine any draw of Series 7 in which you're not going to be asked to recognize that somebody who owns the stock and wants to generate additional income is going to do a covered call. B is in boy. B is in boy. Uh, all the following positions expose a customer on limited risk except. Uh, I like this one as well, right? We have in uh, here a partial hedge. C is a partial hedge. You know, to effectively hedge being short 200 shares, you don't need an obligation to buy the stock. You need a choice. We said for protection, you're going to buy. B is unhedged, unhedged hedged. <laughs> that has unlimited risk. C has unlimited risk. And D has unlimited risk. So a, it's pretty smart to buy back. Let's just, again, as I told you, what I like to do, what I like to do is not testable, but uh, I like to say, okay, what am I looking at from an option perspective? And that's a choice to buy back the stock. There's a choice to buy the stock at the strike price. And that's a pretty interesting, uh, nifty thing to be able to do, uh, particularly if I'm short. You know, I think of options as being about floors and ceilings. And that puts in a ceiling so we can buy back the broad stock or whatever the strike is and give it back to the person we borrowed it from. An investor is short stock at 70. The stock is now 40. So, so far, so good, right? I'm trying to sell high and buy back low. I haven't bought it back low yet. I anticipate the price will continue to climb. That's cool. To hedge against a rise, so I want protection. So when I want protection, I'm going to buy the option. And what I want to have a choice to do is buy back the borrowed stock. And so I'm going to buy the call. Eight, an active uh, option trader establishes the following position. So uh, if you've been with me any length of time and you've watched my options, you know there's eight things you get asked about a spread. And one of those things is the break even. And as a test taking trick, you should definitely know that the break even is somewhere uh, between 40 and 50. As again, I said, I think of options about floors and ceilings. And so the option that break even is somewhere in there. Now, we have a memory aid device to help us remember how to get break even in a call spread, and that is Cal. Cal. And that stands for call add to the lower. So the way we're going to get the break even is we're going to add the lower strike. To the lower strike. Oh, man, I'm trying to get a font that works. <laughs> oh, let's try that one. A little better. So call and to the lower. So we're going to take the uh, lower strike here, which is 40, and we're going to add the net premium, the net premium, which in this case, that's money out, and this is money in. So this is a four-point credit spread, so we're going to get 40 plus four, and we get our break even of 44. Uh, by the way, this is a bearish spread. So this is a credit spread. We want the contracts to expire. So we can keep the money. We want the difference of the premiums to narrow. 
whenever we collect money, the best case is we keep it. So our max gain is four points or $400. And the gain and loss always equals the difference in the strikes. Again, this is not a lecture or for you. I got, I got probably three or four lectures on spreads. I've got don't hate the eight. I've got advanced option strategies. So, you know, this is an explication. This is not a lecture. And we got our break even. And then the last thing we have to figure out is that this is bearish. And if you do that menu, you've got my guarantee that whatever they want to know, you've got the answer. Uh, the question here is what is the break even? And the break even is 44. And always expresses a per share, always expresses per share. And then I just told you that's what I just showed you was this menu. Those are all the things you got to know about a spread. If a customer buys uh, five ABC uh, 50 calls at five and buys uh, five ABC September 50 puts at three, that is a straddle. A straddle is when you're long two different types of contracts or short two different types of contracts. What you're straddling here is 50. So you've got to be able to identify it as a straddle. That's what we've done there. It is a straddle. We're straddling 50. The second thing you got to be able to do on a straddle is calculate the break evens. It's the only strategy where you have two break evens. You have an upside break even, in this case, 58, and a downside break even, in this case, 42. Then you got to determine where it's profitable. If it's short, inside, long, outside. If it's, uh, we want it to be above 58 or below 42. And then when you use it, we're uh, here, we're going to buy a straddle. We're expecting volatility. We're expecting volatility. Uh, we just calculated the break evens, which was 58. That's our upside break even, and 42 is our downside break even. Uh, I like this one. I'm working on another lecture right now, or I just posted a lecture about this. How to identify the spread when it's missing premiums. And so here we should know that higher strike put contracts have greater premiums. We should definitely know that. So when I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the 60 put versus the 45 put, I say to myself, self, the 60 put I'm selling is going to have the greater premium. And that means this is going to be a credit put spread. And then I should know the larger premium dominates the position. And the larger premium is gonna be this 60 put and selling a put is bullish. So this is the one time, you know, where you gotta be careful. I can't tell you how many uh, test takers think credit means bearish. It does not always mean that. Here's an example where it does not mean that. A credit put spread is bullish. Uh, by the way, the trick that I always share with people is bulls because you're long the lower strike. Any uh, spread, if you're long the lower strike, doesn't matter, debit, credit, call, put. Here it's 45 and you are long the lower, so that means you are a bull. And again, we're just showing you that, that that's what that looks like. Uh, here it looks like what's different is the month. So we have a July and we have a in October, and again, uh, people tell me on debrief that they've had to do this. And so what's different here is the time. And so we call that a calendar spread. Boom. Uh, diagonal would be both the months are different and the strikes are different, both. Uh, individual responsible for the overall supervision of all the firm's options activities on behalf of its customers must be a series four, that is a registered option principal. The point at AU, at AU. Uh, which of the following orders would be used to eliminate or reduce a short option position? So three things can happen on option. The contract can be traded, it can be exercised, or it can expire. If you go to close it out, you do so by doing a closing purchase. So a closing purchase is how we're going to eliminate an open short position. So the answer there is D, D. The term tranche, that's the fancy French word for slice. And you give something a fancy French name, you can charge more for it. Snails with butter, not getting much for that. Escargot and burr, now we're talking about. So when we're talking about a tranche, what we're talking about is a collateralized mortgage obligation, where we carve up a Ginnie Mae mortgage pool into various cascading cash flows. Those are called CMOs. And uh, you definitely need to know the difference between a plan amortization class, the earlier cash flows having more predictability and lower risk, the tax plan amortization classes and the tax targeted amortization classes 
having uh, the later cash flows, less predictability and more risk. And you definitely need to know that the investor has to sign a suitability statement. These are derivative securities like options. They derive their performance uh, from the uh, mortgage pool. You're not buying proportion ownership in the pool. You're buying a cash flow from the mortgage pool. A, a direct participation program, a direct participation program partnership must avoid at least two characteristics of a corporation. You know, we don't want to be deemed to be a corporation because we like to flow through the tax consequences. Which two are the easiest to avoid? Well, you know, partnerships do not have a continuity of life. Typically, a partnership has a finite life, five, 10 years where we sell off the real estate and, you know, settle up. And uh, partnerships do not have freely transferable interest. You can't get in or out of the partnership without the permission of the general partner. Now, both uh, partnerships and corporations have centralized management. Partnerships, uh, corporations have freely transferable interest. Partnerships do not. And then we said cor corporations have continuity life and they have centralized management. Uh, don't overdose on partnerships, maybe two, three, four max partnership questions. Most of the vendors go complete overboard on you know, partnerships as it relates to what's actually on the exam. If a client who seeks a diversification through real estate is concerned about illiquidity, which of the investing in real estate, which would be suitable? So well, most of the REITs on the test are gonna be the publicly traded version. And so a real estate investment trust would be a way to have a real estate asset allocation, but still have the liquidity of a stock as it trades on New York or uh, NASDAQ. I haven't seen any trade on New York. A lot of them trade on New York. If your client's real estate limited partnership goes bankrupt, which of the following are paid before your client? Well, your client's going to be really upset if the general partner gets paid before your, your, your client or other limited partners get paid. So it's going to be the bank, right? The bank that holds the mortgage on the property or has the unsecured uh, loans on the property, right? So two and three, the bank is at the front of the line. Uh, I just told you this is a test question. Which of the ones provides investors with the most predictable, most predictability? It's the earlier cash flows, which is choice B, which is choice B. Uh, the most stringent test of a corporation's ability to meet its current obligations is current. So current means current, right? 12, less than 12 months. So uh, we have what's called the acid test ratio, or quick ratio. And it's just like the current ratio, but it doesn't include inventory. So the quick assets are going to be the current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. That's called the quick ratio. Uh, and that is more stringent than the current ratio. And so A and C are about liquidity, uh, D is about solvency, and so the answer here is A. Uh, market timing is normally associated with which of the following. So, you know, if you're going to be aggressive like that, we call that tactical asset allocation, right? You know, uh, you're moving money around. By the way, that means you're going to have additional cost, less tax efficiency, so that's called tactical asset allocation. Uh, very testable to know that the FINRA 5% markup policy does not apply to primary issues. It only applies to the secondary market, not the primary market. Very testable. So it doesn't apply to C because C is a primary transaction. And in a prospectus on the front page, we tell you what the spread is in aggregate and per share. Well, we mean the total amount raised and per share, typically 7 8%. So, you know, it's typically north of 5 uh, market interest rates have risen steadily over the past several months. You know, I've, I always joke, if somebody asks you about economics, finance, and investments, you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. If you just shut up, you sound good. You'll say, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They go up and down. Is that good news or bad news? So the market price of which two of the following shares would probably reflect the biggest impact. So what we're looking at here is which of these is going to be a fixed income investment vehicle. Now, you should have been struggling with uh, number three. You should not have been struggling with number three. So you need three in your answer set. So that gives you a 50-50. Growth stock, who cares? Growth stocks, companies aren't typically borrowing money. Money market is short term, so it's going to be doing that. Now, counterintuitive, but public utility stocks have a large amount of debt on their balance sheet. You know, the capitalization of a corporation consists of two things, equity and debt. And, uh, you know, it's called capitalization. And utility companies have a large amount of debt and a little sliver of equity. 
And so that means they're going to be more dependent on interest rates as they, you know, run their business and finance their business. Kind of counterintuitive, but we say that they trade on equity, meaning large amount of debt, a little amount of equity. So the answer is three and four. Oh, my goodness. A customer age 62 wants to retire at 64. Uh, has accumulated investments in IRA currently value of 500,000. The IRA portfolio consisting of all mutual funds is allocated as follows. 70% growth, 10% corporate bonds, 20% in the sector fund. Still wanting to be using mutual funds, which would be the most suitable reallocation of the portfolio? Well, again, I don't see anything in here about somebody being in a high tax bracket. So I'm going to get rid of the muni choices because for muni to be an option, they would have to say they're in an uncomfortably high tax bracket. There'd have to be something about their tax bracket. So I'm going to get rid of that. And then it looks like to me that uh, an 80% in the index funds sounds like that would be overweight in terms of getting close to retirement. I mean, it doesn't get to the right answer all the time, but if we take 100 minus 62, you know, 38% sounds like that would be a more uh, of an asset allocation model, just a trick that a party trick that people use. So I think I'm going to go with C here uh, based on, uh, you know, taking that asset allocation and stocks down as you get closer to retirement. Yep, there we go. A uh, large amount of cash deposits into an account may indicate that the customer is engaged in dividend reinvestment. No, arbitrage is perfectly legal. Arbitrage is profiting from price discrepancies and there's no problem with that. And we have people who are called arbitrageurs and they profit from price discrepancy. Yeah, it sounds like it might be money laundering. Might be money laundering. All following statements regarding customer confirmations are true except the customer may must receive the confirmation no later than business day after trade date. That's false, or it's by settlement. Uh, the confirmation must disclose commissions if the firm act as an agent. That is true. The confirmation must disclose a control relationship. So. If you're a Merrill broker and you sell Bank of America stock to a customer on the confirmation, it will tell you there is a control relationship between Bank of America, the issuer, and Merrill Lynch, the broker dealer. That's true. The confirmation must disclose whether we're market makers here. That's true. So it's uh, A, right? Boom. The confirmation goes in there by settlement. A client's account shows no activity other than some dividends. Uh, based on it's going to be quarterly. Remember, it's going to be monthly if there are penny stocks in the account. Very testable. Monthly, if there's a penny stock. A penny stock would be a non-NASDAQ OTC stock under five. Otherwise, quarterly. Uh, the city of Podunk has an outstanding 25-year maturity issue that's callable in seven years. It has been pre-refunded, and they've established an escrow account containing the proper government securities it's called slugs. Approximately the call in the original. And quoting the original issue, Listen, anytime, ladies and gentlemen, you have a choice of yield to call, that's going to be your answer. You're not going to, the old bonds, you're not going to get to hold them to maturity because they already have an escrow account. They're going to call them away from you. By the way, if I were a test taker, anytime an answer set and yield to call was offered to me, I would take it. Now, you can certainly review that. This is, again, not a lecture. This is an explication of uh, practice questions. Uh, John uh, recently moved his registration to a new FINRA member firm. One month later, to John's surprise, his former client, Miss Castle, transferred account to John's new firm. FINRA Rule 2273 requires certain disclosures be made to new customers when the former rep moves to a new firm. Which of the following statements is a correct? Uh, it only applies when it's institutional. It's the opposite. Nobody cares about institutional accounts. Institutional customers, institutional accounts are capable of protecting their own assets, their own interests. So that's not true. B, uh, FINRA 23 is not applicable because there's no individualized contact. John's new broker dealer must deliver. There we go. And so they can make a informed decision about whether Miss Castle wants to follow John over there, right? You know, is it getting additional payout? There's going to be some stuff that maybe is not available at the new firm, you know, whatever the case may be. A technical analyst has been charting X, Y, Z and notes that it fluctuates between 36, very testable, that's called the support, the support line on a chart, 
and 41. That's called the resistance. If the analyst expects a breakout through resistance, that's the upper line, 41. Which of the following orders should be placed? This is very testable. I say, well, I want to go long if it trades at or through uh, whatever that uh, resistance line is. So I'm going to place a buy stop and very testable. A buy stop has to be placed above the current market price. And so the answer is going to be A, A. Uh, by the way, the other version of this question would be the analyst expects a breakout through the support line, what would be placed, and you played a sell stop below 36, like 35, for example. So be prepared for either version of that question. Uh, this one I think is stupid. I don't know why everybody goes so overkill on margin. That's, you know, one 440%. I wouldn't worry about that at all. There are three or four margin questions on the Series 7, and that's certainly not one of them. I have a lecture called Don't Overdose on Margin. Every transaction made by a registered rep for a customer's account is subject to FINRA approval. Another test-taking trick that you could get this right by reduction of the ridiculous. What would the world look like if FINRA had to approve every transaction from every customer now? Must be read on written order from the customer, subject to cancellation by either party, must be reviewed by a principal of the member firm indeed, right? So, you know, your principal is supposed to supervise and make sure that you're not doing transactions that could be characterized as churning. Trades are excessive, transactions are excessive in size and frequency, for example. That you're not uh, front running, trading ahead of customers, for example. A customer is holding 450 shares in registered form, turns on a sell order on Monday for regular rate delivery. So we expect that we're gonna be able to deliver the stock on T plus two. Who has the initial responsibility for ensuring the security is in good deliverable form? Well, you know, that would be you, right? Say, where is it, Mr. Jones? Is it in your safe deposit box? Is it, you know, where is it? Uh, code of arbitration is used to several civil disputes. It's uh, mandatory between which of these? So a member in a clearing firm? Yep, a member and its associate person. Not sure if you understand that, but in your U4, you said if you had a problem, you would uh, go to arbitration, except for HR issues. That's standard. And so there we go. The three is not, right? That's the standard HR you know, department kind of process. So not three. Uh, a member and a client who has signed a predispute. Remember, the customer has to sign the arbitration agreement for that to be binding. So as long as they sign that clause, which they did, then it's going to be binding. One, two, and four. Uh, I would definitely know on the test that to be binding, they have to sign. Catch 22, if they don't sign, we're not going to open the account. Uh, the cop, you do bad things, the cop. Go to procedure, handles trade practice complaints. That's FINRA's Department of Enforcement. They can censure you. That's written disapproval of your conduct. They can expel you. They can suspend you. They don't have a badge and a gun. Stupid, but testable. They can't throw you in jail. They can't throw you in jail. Again, I love this answer set. Make sure you got all the ones that are used here. So code of procedure is not civil disputes. Remember, that's trade practice complaints. Code of conduct, very testable. It's the right answer to a different question. That's the ethical behavior that broker dealers and associated persons owe customers. Uh, uniform practice code, that's the uh, standardized practices and secondary training of securities. The code of arbitration, ding, 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 ding. Make sure you got that answer set down because that answer set is very testable on the test. And that is D is in dog, D is in dog. Uh, communication with the public include all the following except, all the following except, right? Information on the new mutual fund intended for uh, sales personnel. Again, that's not going to you know, anybody who's a customer, right? So, ooh, so B, uh, C and D certainly are, and A is not. A is not. Uh, which of the following statements regarding the differences between 506B, that's a private placement where we can actually have up to 35 non-accredited investors, but we're not going to be able to solicit. That's what 506B is. 506C is where we are doing a Reg D private placement. Uh, we can't have any non-accredited investors, but we will be allowed to solicit. So that's the distinction between 506B and 506C. Remember, Reg D is a safe harbor under 33. It's an exempt transaction. So rule 50C, sorry, let me move my picture out of the way. Rule 506Cs can be advertised, but that's true. So one is true. 
506Cs are limited. That's false. Remember, it's the B version that's limited. So one is true, two is false. So I need one without two. And I'm just showing my answer set. By the way, on, the, on seven, there are no multiples. There's you know no multiples on seven. Uh, three, rule 506 are limited exclusively to there. We, that's true. Well, not a, yep, that's true. So one and three are true. The bad actor, I don't know what the bad actor, that's just ridiculous. I, I think what they would say on the test is no one and nothing is exempt from anti-fraud provisions. Uh, Securities Act of 33 requires securities used by all the following to register and be subject to a prospectus, except very testable to know that the US government is exempt from all of this stuff, right? When Congress passed 33, they said your own government wouldn't rip you off. So the US government is an exempt issuer of securities and therefore all the securities are exempt. The issuer is exempt, the securities are exempt. Uh, by the way, it doesn't use the word exempt, but that's the word for that. If you're not registering the security, that means the security or the issuer is exempt. Now I'd warn you on your third leg of your testing journey, that's gonna be a huge part of the exam. 63, 66, 65. Uh, that was my 30 minute warning. So our kind of thing, we've been at about an hour if you wanna take another break. You know, on the channel, I try and keep it diversified in terms of I have some 10, 15, 20 minute lectures. I have some hour lectures. I have some two hour lectures. Explications like this, we're doing 85 questions. Uh, they typically come in at over an hour. An affiliate of an issuer holds control stock for five months. So control stock is all the stock held by control persons and their family members. The affiliate is a family member. And five months, uh, you know, the, the hold isn't about the stock, it's about the volume. So, you know, um, be careful though. We do have what's called the short swing profit rule. And so this five months could be meaningful because, you know, we're not gonna allow uh, insiders and affiliates who own control stock to make short swing profits. That might be what this is about. So we'll just file that away. We sell a hundred, a thousand shares for a thousand dollar profit, ten thousand dollar profit. Sounds like, yeah, we got a problem here. So short swing is six months. And what you have to do, don't you love that word? You have to disgorge it to the issuer. That is very much a test uh, question. Now, when I say it's a test question, I don't mean you're going to see it verbatim. It just means you could expect something along the lines of that, right? It's testable content. Yeah. So try not to memorize phraseology too much because, you know, that might uh, cause you. Well, as I said, what we're doing is uh, explicating questions that I typically use in a uh, in-person Series 7 class. And it's a total of 85 questions. What I usually start them out with is a warm-up or pretest. You know, pretest scares people. So warm-up. But now with the uh, pandemic, i have sometimes using this at the close of class. But uh, that's what this explication is about. It's about practice questions from class that if I have time that I do uh, in the class with uh, students. And so what I'm doing is explicating those, sharing them with you and shout out to Kaplan for uh, allowing you the free look at some of these questions. And again, if you want to supplement your, your uh, if you're not using Kaplan with the QBank, it's about 60 bucks and you get 10% uh, off doing so. Uh, so it comes in about 60 bucks if you wanna buy the whole QBank. Anyway, so let's go over these last uh, 20 questions and we'll call it a day here. So the rule for minimum maintenance level in a long margin account, you should definitely know that's 25% long. You should definitely know, so the answer is B as in boy. You should definitely know, uh, for short, it would have been C as in Charlie. And if it said initial, that would have been 50%. So the answer number one is uh, B as in boy. Two, which of the following types of oil and gas limited partnership programs is the riskiest? Again, very testable. It's exploratory. You boldly go where no one's gone before. You drill a hole. You either win big or you lose big. The answer number two is A is an atom. A is an atom. Uh, I guess I probably should, just in case you're shutting them off and trying to do them, maybe you know, I'll tell you what the answer is, uh, just in case you're doing it that way. Uh, your customer's long 100 shares of XYZ at 30. Current market price is 45, looking pretty good. Customer is bullish on the stock, but is becoming nervous about a possible downturn. Uh, we're going to place a sell stop below the market to protect the profit. We use sell stops to stop losses or protect profits. I would also know, I would also know that you could accomplish the same thing. Well, not the same thing, a little different. You have to pay a premium, but you also might want to consider a long put as well. The answer to that is D is in dog. D is in dog. What did a customer pay for a bond at 94? The bond is trading at a discount. 
And remember that is 94% of par, 94% of par. So that's 940 bucks. Uh, debt service and principal and revenue bonds could be paid by, again, we could get this right with the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other, right? And we said, boy, that's very testable to be able to distinguish between GOs and revenues. And user fees goes with revenue bonds. Income taxes go to state GOs. A couple of cities, Philadelphia, New York, but primarily state GOs. Ad valerum is property taxes, local government, and other taxes, right? State or local. Uh, defensive stock is a stock in a corporation, delivers products and services resilient to the business cycle. And regardless of the business cycle, nobody wants to go back to the stone age. And so the answer is D is in dog. An aerospace stock, now cyclical. You can wait purchasing a new plane, new airplane. A customer purchased a full faith and credit municipal bond. And that's called a GO. We said that's a big part of your test is distinguishing between those. How are securities issued by municipality treated for tax purposes? Be careful. Without telling you where I live and what kind of bond I'm going to buy, all you can tell me is, Dean, they are federally tax exempt. To determine whether they're state and local, I have to tell you where I live and what kind of bond I'm going to buy. Nine, guaranteed test question. You definitely know that public housing authority bonds have the full faith and credit of the United States government. So make sure you know Ginny Mays have the full faith and credit. Public housing authority bonds have the full faith and credit and direct obligations of the U.S. Treasury. You should definitely know that Reg T, Reg T is a part of 34, and that's what gave the Federal Reserve Board the authority over credit extension of broker dealers to customers. Right now, it's 50%. And so the Federal Reserve Board says customers have to initially be at risk for 50%. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board says we can't lend you money by new issues. It's considered a new issue 30 days from the effective date, and we can't lend you money to buy options. So, eleven. A customer owns a ten thousand eight percent treasury bond. Ten thousand eight percent treasury bond. So that means ten thousand times 8% means I'm going to get $800. They'll be paid to me in two semi-annual installments. I'm in a 28% tax bracket. So I'm going to pay 28% uh, in taxes, 28% uh, of uh, $800 is $224. You should definitely know that the state would like to tax me, but can't. So the answer is D, right? I can go neener, neener, neener. When I buy U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Treasury can and will tax me 28%. States will like to, but can't. 12 is a guaranteed test question. You missed number 12, I'd flunk you immediately on the entire test. You should definitely know that the maximum gift or gratuity that an employee of one member firm can give the employee of another member firm is $100. You should definitely know that doesn't count normal deductible business expenses doesn't count reminder advertising. You should definitely know the maximum sales loan of mutual fund is eight and a half percent. 14, the premium on an option contract is three and a quarter. So hopefully you're getting good at this. So remember that's three and a quarter for a contract that governs a hundred shares. So that's $325. By the way, you should be able to tell me that's the max loss. You know, the max loss is 325. Now, we don't know whether this is a call or a put, but we know you did an opening purchase. That's how you establish this position. And we know when you buy an option, what you can lose is 325. So what we don't know is, you know, was this a long call or a long put? That we don't know. Uh, customer purchases an XYZ, October 40, call at four. When the market value is at 42, who cares? Call up, strike price plus premium. So it doesn't matter that it's at 42. Now, why not practice our skills? Why not practice our skills? We have the break even. 
This is a choice to buy the stock at 40. I buy the stock at 40. I paid four points. I'm out 44. I have unlimited gain potential. I'm bullish. My max loss is uh, $400. My max gain is unlimited. Break even is 44. And I'm a bull. Uh, right now, I'm paying two points in it for intrinsic value. The intrinsic value of a 40 call at 42 is two and two points for time value. And then what I'm going to try and do is turn my time value into intrinsic value. The only two ways you can make money in an investment is income stream and or price appreciation. So if there's no income stream, the only way you're going to make money is through appreciation. And if you have raw land on developed land, there is no income stream. So the only way you can make money is through appreciation. Uh, XYZ has declared a 75 cent cash dividend. Uh, the stock closed the day before the X. So the X date is the first date on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. Right. So if you buy it on the X, you're not getting that 75 cents. But if you buy it the day before, you will. That's a function of the uniform practice code. That's not set by the board of directors. And so very testable to know the X date is the first date on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. It's one business data prior to record. And so the stock should open up since now that's going to be no longer available. It's going to open up, should open up at 44 and a quarter. I always struggle on 18 because I think of it as assets minus liabilities equals net worth. But you know, the uh, balance sheet balances is a picture in time as of assets. And again, we should be able to kind of have a general understanding of this is not only from a corporate standpoint, but also from an investor standpoint. Uh, XYZ is issued equipment trust certificates. Uh, the answer there is going to be D. Uh, if it was marketable securities placed in escrow, if it was marketable securities placed in escrow, that would have been a collateral trust bond. And if it was the full faith and credit issuer, that would have been a debenture. Uh, there we go. We got our teeter totter again. We have a bond with a coupon of eight. Uh, it yields a six. And so, again, that means we paid a premium. And we should know that we're going to have a yield to call as what we're probably going to have to deal with premium. Okay. Well, as I said, shout out to uh, Kaplan for allowing us to explicate uh, questions and give you a free look on those uh, and give me permission to do so. And uh, you got a free look at some of those questions. There's 85 questions there. I know that I get a lot of requests on the channel for practice questions. So we'll continue to build up all the series uh, playlists with more practice questions for you. As I said, I'll put this up in our normal uh, rotation. And we got two more practice finals coming. Uh, I'm going to call this class practice questions, but we got uh, practice test five and six for the seven coming very shortly. Uh, five one, I'm, I'm almost done writing. And then I'll probably do a Kaplan uh, simulated final as well. Uh, okay, so stay dedicated, stay disciplined, stay organized, and uh, you will certainly make your mark. Bye-bye.